Okay, so um, my name is John Bernardo. I'm the managing broker of KW Sac Metro. I've been in the business about 13 years. I have a mega real estate team that does a lot of my day-to-day -day business. We have about 60 to 80 transactions a year. I um, own a property management company, works on the company part owner here. We have about 200 agents in the office here in the Sacramento area, and we do very well. We're number one, top, top 10 in the greater Sacramento area, as well as top 1,000 in the United States. We're like 863rd in production. So we do a lot of stuff here. And this is uh, practice of real estate disclosures. There are seven sections of the test. We go through one section per session over seven weeks, because usually it's taking you about two months to get your test date anyways. So this is a way to help you get that. This is a question and answer format. Uh, please, re I'll read the question. Please answer as much as you can. Uh, don't worry, there's no wrong or dumb answers. If you don't know um, what even the question means or anything about why the answer is the answer it is, that's okay. Pause, ask, I can explain it. I'll even do drawings and stuff to help you understand um, the process. So. Aside from the Homeowner's Guide to Earthquake Safety and the Seismic, the Seismic Safety Commission has also developed the blank. Even if the buyer received either guide to earthquake safety, the seller and the broker must still disclose that the property is in an earthquake fault zone. C, I think. B. It's actually, oops, why is it keep doing this? It's actually A, so they have a homeowner's guide to earthquake safety and they have a commercial property owner's guide to earthquake safety. The seller is obligated to provide the buyer with a TDS, which is which the buyer then has blank days after hand delivery of the document or blank days after mailing of the document to review and cancel the agreement if it contains adverse information not acceptable to the buyer. B. We got three and seven days. And what else? B. A. It is A. Thank you, Mindy. Three days of hand delivered, five days after mailing. So, essentially, in California, no one hand delivers anymore. We all email it over. So, um, it is five days essentially from the delivery of the TDS that the buyer has the right to rescind the contract if they don't like anything. Else. An unlicensed agent in a real estate office put together an advertisement for the licensee. This advertisement must be C. C. Correct, approved by the licensee. There are a lot of restrictions if you hire someone as an assistant, if they're unlicensed, what they can and can't do. So the standard of care owed by a broker is the degree of care that is reasonably prudent real estate agent, licensee, sorry, would exercise and is measured by the degree of knowledge required to obtain a license. Such a degree of knowledge is through one of the following. D. D. Correct, all the above, so. Trust funds received by the broker must be placed in the hands of the owner of the funds in a mutual escrow depository or maintain a trust account no later than blank business days following receipt of the funds by the broker. Three. B. Three oh. days, but so when you receive a check or any money that is not yours from a client, you must put it in the trust account with your broker within three business days. So. Blank is a condition in a mortgage or trustee that lets a parcel of land to be freed from serving as collateral for the mortgage or trustee prior to its full satisfaction. D. All the above. C. We have C. Anyone else? A. <laughs> it is B. The only one you guys didn't say was partially reconveyed. So 
This is a condition in the mortgage of trustee that lets a parcel land be freed from serving as collateral for the mortgage for a trustee on this whole, prior to his full satisfaction. So what does that mean? That means there's a loan on a property or several properties, and they're going to let one of them out as collateral for the loan, but the loan's still in place. Okay. We call that partial reconveyance. The reason, and it obviously, if the loan was paid off, and they release the full loan, that would be known as full reconveyance, okay? Or just reconveyance for that matter. But partial reconveyance happens when only part of the loan, part of the land or part of the properties are, are taken out. And typically you would see partial reconveyance in new home developments. So when you see a new home development, you know, they open up in phases and there's, you know, we're, we're opening up eight homes for a phase, right? The builder has often gotten a, a construction loan from a large bank or someone to do that project. The bank has then encumbered the whole property, all the lots on the land, right? And when they go to sell them is when the builder is allowed to then, yeah, go ahead. If you, We're going to release our conveyance on these so you can sell these properties, and then we'll let you let you do the next ones. And those are partial reconveyance of either time, right? And that's why they sell them, so that the bank can make sure that, you know, they're building on time and that they're, they're only paying construction fees as needed, right? So. Any questions on that? As stated in the California Business Profession Code, Section 10145A1, a real estate broker who assets funds belonging to others in connection with the transaction shall deposit all those funds and not immediately place into a neutral investment account or into the hands of a broker and so or into a Correct. C. He said C. Very good. Very good. Uh, the following are poisonous gases, except what's not a poisonous gas? Poisonous gas. Poison. B. B. Poison. 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 Except. A. Is D. What is carbon dioxide? So, nitrogen dioxide, oxygen dichloride, and sulfur tetrafluoride are all naturally occurring poisonous gases. Okay. Carbon dioxide is what you exhale. You inhale oxygen, you exhale carbon dioxide. So, if it was a poisonous gas, we'd all be dead. So. Receiving and handling trust funds in the real estate transaction may be summed up with the three R's. The three R's are what? What are the three R's? A. Correct, A, responsibility, requirements, and records. Can you tell the, uh, the Department of Real Estate really cares about trust fund handling? Actually, of all the violations that they do, and when they do audits or investigations, trust fund handling is the biggest one. The earthquake hazard disclosure must clearly specify whether the transfer has no actual knowledge that the dwelling has deficiencies that are material to the transaction and that may increase the dwelling's vulnerability to an earthquake damage. One of such deficiencies would be what? A. D. D. <laughs> Correct. D. So earthquake has, and actually I'm going to show you guys because we're here last one second. Just for your knowledge, you will come across this in the real estate world. So We just don't know. Earthquake. All right, I want to 
going to share my screen here with another one. Hold on one second. So this is an earthquake hazards report as, as we use in real estate today in California. So there's a things in here that they require that are considered um, things that would affect the earthquake survivability of a home. Is a water heater strap based and anchored to resist falling during an earthquake? Is the house anchored or bolted to the foundation? Does the house have cripple walls? Cripple walls meaning, um, will they um, uh, crumble if they, if they um, will they fail if, they, if it shakes? If the exterior foundation consists of unconnected concrete piers or posts, is the exterior foundation or product made of unreinforced masonry? That means it is masonry, but they didn't use rebar in it to reinforce it. Is house built on a hillside? Are the exterior tall, sphere, the exterior tall foundation walls braced? Um, exterior walls on the house, part of the made with unreinforced masonry. Is there an area over the garage? Is the house within a fault zone? Are they near a fault zone, an actual fault zone? Is the house, is the house outside a size of a hazard zone? So these are all questions that you would receive on when you're doing earthquake hazard disclosure. Any questions on that? Yeah, the quiet crown, quiet crown. Right. Broker Vivian owns property rentals. She should put the security deposits in what? Hey. Anyone else? Hey. No, she shouldn't put B in her own bank account. Why should she put her money in the bank account? Because she's the principal and not an agent. <laughs> <laughs> so what is a trust account for? Can you explain that? Why, why do we have trust accounts? It's to keep the client or uh, um, the person that you're representing money separate from your own and from being yeah. used. Yeah, correct, Mindy. So, so a trust account is, a, is an account that you hold other people's money that you have as your role as a licensee, right? So you're a licensee. Now you're able to accept money that people use toward a transaction or the rental or whatever right? As a licensee. You cannot co-mingle those funds with your funds. That means you can't put in the same bank account with your funds. You want to keep those separate. So broker Vivian, and this question is kind of a trick question because she, broker Vivian owns her own homes. She owns rental homes. She gets money from that rental home. She can't put that money in with the trust account. She has to put it in her own bank account because that would be co-mingling money with other people's money. Does that make sense? So, for example, I have a property management company. We have trust accounts. I also have an account that's mine because I have rentals as well. And when we get the rental money, my rental money is deposited into my accounts, not in the trust account. Does that make sense? Do some some people have a trust account for their like rental properties though, right? Like a trust. I I I've, I feel like I've seen it where somebody has. Um, like a trust where they put their rental money. Is that like a li liability thing? Oh, okay. So there's difference. Yes. Yeah. So they may put their money in a trust, right? So a trust having to do with that, um, they don't, they put their assets, all the homes into a trust. So they put it into a trust account. That's for the, it's a private trust, not like a trust as a licensee, but there's also trust that you can make. So. Um, most people will have trust. If you have a lot of property, I have to, if you have one property, you should have trust. But essentially, you can make a trust, which which means you put all your assets into trust. So when you pass away, it it go. It doesn't have to go through probate. It goes to whoever your kids are, whoever you designate. It goes to. That's called. Oh, gotcha. Trust. Thank you. So that you know, often people who have multiple properties, for example, we have a trust. I have multiple properties. My properties are owned in the trust, right? So if I pass away. None of my properties have to go through probate. They're all lumped under one ownership entity and then it transfers to my kids, right? Blank is a cancer causing, colorless, odorless, tasteless radioactive gas form during the natural breakdown of uranium and soil rock and water. Hey. 
<laughs> you guys are all crypto. This one. Hey, correct the rate on them. Flood hazard, flood hazard boundary map to identify general flood hazards within a community. On a flood hazard boundary map, an area that falls within the 100 year flood boundary is called what? B. B. C. It is the special flood zone areas. So in Sacramento, we have special flood zone areas. Where is the most prominent special flood zone area? Discovery. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Discovery Park. So Discovery Park, um, north the Natomas area of Sacramento, the northern part of Sacramento, is all in a flood, special flood zone area. So everyone out here is required to have um, uh, flood insurance on their home. Now, what is a 100-year flood boundary? Anyone? Don't know. All right, so ha, this is how they do it. So you know in Sacramento, we have levees around our rivers. And when they started building up in the Thomas area back in early 2000, right around 1999, 2000, um, they had upgraded the levees above a hundred year level. That means that, that the Army Corps of Engineers believes that, that because of the height and the strength of the levees, there would be there be a storm, only one storm in a hundred years that would cause that area to flood. That's the standard. If you're below a hundred years, then you have to have flood insurance. If you're above that, but below 300 is, is optional, but not required. But then Hurricane Katrina happened in New Orleans. Some of you may remember that. Um, some of the areas in New Orleans that got flooded were not supposed to get flooded based on their rating system. And so the Army Corps of Engineers revised all their rating systems. And so the Natomas area of Sacramento in 2008 was designated as a flood zone again. When it's designated a flood zone, you're not allowed to build. So if you come out to the Natomas area, you will see homes from built from 1999 to 2000, I mean to 2008, and then you'll see no homes built between 2008 and about 2016. They allowed them, they did repairs to levees, and now they let them to build again. And so now you'll see home, there's an eight year gap or not eight, nine year gap where there was no homes built out here. So, and that's because of the flood boundary. So, um, so any questions on that? No, I got it, it makes sense. All of the following are disclosures upon the transfer of residential property, except what? C. D. Correct. When you transfer residential property in California, you must disclose certain things. Obviously, these are all in our forms, but you must disclose there's a termination right that you have to provide a real estate transfer disclosure statement or a TDS, which is very important. You must report whether there are local option real estate bonds or taxes on the property. You gotta disclose the property taxes on the property. You gotta disclose whether it's close to an ordinance location, which is where the military would uh, bomb or shoot things for practice. Um, window security bars, if there's industrial uses on the property, or if the property has been, been declared a meth lab, those are things you must disclose in the state of California. The real estate transfer disclosure statement, TDS describes the condition of the property. When there's a sale, the law requires a seller to give the prospective buyer a TDS covering the following items except. D. 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 <laughs> yeah, they don't have to disclose marital problems. In fact, let me show you one here. This is the most important document. Oops, is it loaded? Oh, there. Can you see it? Yeah, we can yes. see it. Okay. So this is the most important disclosure that realtors deal with within California. This is a required document. Most lawsuits 
that happen in real estate are from the buyer against the seller for the buyer found a defect on the property that the seller knew about but didn't disclose it because they didn't want to disclose it because it would hurt the value of the home. Make sense? So these are the things, and this is literally recording law. It says, what, what is on the property? And you would check whether the rain, there's an oven, there's a microwave, all this stuff, exhaust fans, is there 220 volt wiring, fireplaces, is there a gas starter, what type of roof, what's the age of the roof, all this stuff. And it says, is anything not in operating condition? And then we go here and there's, are the seller aware of any significant defects, malfunction the following? Interior walls, ceilings, floors, exterior walls, insulation, roofs, windows, doors, foundations, slabs, driveways, sidewalks, walls, defensive stairs, plumbing, other structural components. Does that make sense? In this case, it says that there's, there's an issue with the side fence. Then there's questions. Is there any hazardous materials? And all these questions on the property. This must be disclosed to from the buyer to the seller. So um, what you put on there will create liability. What you don't put on there will create liability. So we have to encourage our, our, our sellers to be very truthful in that, and on that. And I actually ask them questions. Is there anything you fix? Anything that's wrong in the winter or the summer? Because what they don't put on there can come back and bite them. A tenant who lives in a residential building which has proposed con condominium conversion project has exclusive right to purchase his or her respective unit and said exclusive right to purchase shall run for a period of not less than blank days from the date the subdivision public report is issued. So this is a tenant living in an apartment building and the, the owner of the building is converting it to condos. And he, has to, he is required in California to give the tenant living in that apartment the exclusive right to purchase the condo in which he is living. Um, but how many days must he give the tenant the option to do that? D. 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 C. It is D. He must give them 90 days to decide they would like to purchase their condo. For dedication of streets and easements, the local government requires the dedication of sufficient land in the subdivision for B D D is correct. Oops. So when a subdivision happens, you guys go out and look at subdivisions and model homes, all the streets and the walking paths and all that were, were simply granted when they do, when the builder applies for a permit to build it, the, the literally the builder is granting all that land to the city for those things, right? So on the subdivided lands law, a preliminary public report, also known as a blank, can be issued and it can allow a subdivider to take reservation deposit monies from buyers but not to sell the parcel. B. What? B. Close, it's A, it's called the pink report. So let's talk about this a little bit. The subdivided lands law, okay? What's considered a subdivision, anyone know? All right. Board. So under the subdivided land law, that means if you are taking a parcel of land and you're going to subdivide it to build homes on it, right? So I'm going to take a 50 acre lot and subdivide it, right? To make if you're going to divide that lot into four, more than four possible parcels, so five or above parcels, you become subject to the subdivided lands law. When you become subject to the subdivided lands law, you must get approval from the Department of Real Estate to do that subdivision development, amongst other things. Obviously, you get the city and county approval and all that stuff. But you also have to get state approval for the Department of Real Estate and the subdivision lenses. They produce the, the, the Department of Real Estate, you submit your application, all the information, the, sub, the um, 
the DRE will issue uh, a preliminary report. That means a report that says, we're not done with it yet, but here's a preliminary. It says you kind of can move forward. It's looking good. It's called the peak report because it has a peak, it comes with a peak cover on it. That allows them to take deposits. So if I'm a builder and I'm going to sell uh, all these, I'm going to build homes and sell these parcels. If I get my peak report, my preliminary report, now I can start advertising to the public and I can collect deposits for people who want to reserve a lot for me to build them a home. Okay. But I can't sell it to them until the final report's done. Any questions on that? So divide the off. You probably need to know it for the test. Funds belonging to a licensee may not be commingled with trust funds. One of the following is considered commingling. D? Yeah, D. Correct. If you hold on the money too long, it's considered commingling because after three days, it's considered you have it in your possession now, personally, and that's considered commingling. So all the things, you can tell they're very keen about keeping your money separate from the trust fund, right? Each tenant of a proposed conversion of their residential building into a condominium project must receive notice of a blank, notice of an exclusive right to purchase of their respective units within blank terms and conditions. The unit will be initially offered to the public or terms more favorable to the tenant. D. Correct. So we now know when someone's doing a condo conversion, they got to give the tenant living in that apartment that's being converted to a condo 90 days to purchase it from the time that the preliminary report's ready. But we also know now that they can't charge that tenant more than they would charge about the, when they publicly advertise it for sale. Okay. Which of the following hazard risks is a broker legally required to disclose on the natural hazards disclosure statement? D. Correct. Hold on. I want to share this. So here is an example of a natural hazard disclosure report here in California. Actually, this is our own company. So. But you can see the main questions are here are, is it in a special flood hazard area? Is it an area of potential flooding? Is it a very high fire severity, fire severity zone? Is it a wildland area that may contain substantial forest fire risk and hazards? Is it an earthquake fault zone? Is it a seismic hazard zone? What's this mean? We already talked about a special flood zone area. That means you're within 100 years. An area of potential flooding is anything less than, I believe, 300 years or maybe 500 years. A very high severity fire head zone, very high fire severity zone is anywhere. It's usually very rural where you're considered um, high fire risk, right? A wildland area is uh, generally forest land that may be considered high risk. And then obviously there's an earthquake fault zone and a seismic hazard zone. An earthquake fault zone means you live within one mile of an actual earthquake fault. So where the fault is in the ground, one mile away. A seismic hazard zone is you live in an area that's near a fault that you would feel the effects of the earthquake strongly if it were to happen. Okay. That is the main gist of the NHG report, but there are other things that they'll cover as well, requirements and other things like that. So, um, but just here. Any questions on that? NHD. No, I'm good. You're good. I like that. Which of the following is not regarded as a material change in a subdivision? So now, remember, we have that preliminary report, and now they're going to issue a full, full report so that they're approved to go forward and make a subdivision happen. But what if something changes? What if they change something about the subdivision? When do they have to go back to the DRE to get a new report done? And this is saying, what is not regarded as a material change where they don't have to go back to the DRE to get that, to get approval to make that change? 
D. Either B, B or D. D. Let's see. So as long as a person builder who's doing the subdivision has an approved report from the DRE, they can proceed with the subdivision. But as the only thing they can change is the price or who they employ as a broker selling the property. If they change any of those things, they can change it without getting approval from the DRE again. But they change anything else. So for example, they change, a, they take out a bike path and make the backyards bigger on the home, on some of the homes, that would be considered a material change. They have to go back to the Department of Real Estate to get a new report before they can proceed. Does that make sense? Clear as mud? All right. Undesirable surroundings of a neighborhood site can be detrimental to the success of a new residential subdivision. Really? Toxic industrial uses, 24-hour factory operations, rail yards, and similar factors render a residential subdivision on a neighboring site highly undesirable. Therefore, the subdivision developer should check with the concerned agencies regarding the location of these undesirable surroundings. One of these agencies is... No. Correct. There are many agencies you should check with. In fact, if you wanted to build a house along the river in Sacramento, you would have to check with 17 agencies and get approval. Mm -hmm. But um, any of you uh, live in the Rancho area? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a um, there's a a development out there called um, Anatolia. I don't know if you guys are aware of it. But near Anatolia, there is this factory and it's a tanning factory. They make leather. They take cow skin and they make leather. But I don't know if you've ever uh, tanned hides. Um, it's, not, it's, a, it's kind of a smelly process to do it, right? And in the summer, if they're running hot and heavy, you can actually smell the tanning smell in the neighborhood. That would be an example of an industrial use causing detrimental effects to a neighborhood. And thus, the closer you are to that tanning facility in that neighborhood, the less your value of home is. <laughs> the Consumer Recovery Account is designed to give financial relief to those who have been victimized by a licensee's fraudulent actions. A successful applicant may be paid with a probable possible total aggregate maximum of blank per transaction. A. Correct A. So there's 50,000 per transaction maximum, but an aggregate total of 250,000. So they, if they were fraud out on five different transactions, you come up with 200. All the followings are types of subdivisions that do not need a public report, except who doesn't need a public report or except. C? Yeah, C. No, none of the above. So the subdivided lands law only applies to residential units being built, whereas the subdivision has more than five units, five or more units. Subdivisions built by public agencies, so it's a sort of low income, income housing community or commercial or industrial subdivision are not required to go through the subdivided lands law. Ooh, all right. Ugh. Blank is, the, is a fact that is significant to a reasonable person in deciding whether to engage or to not engage in a particular transaction. A. Correct. A. Oh, good job. Yeah, so material fact is an important term in real estate. A material fact is something that is that would affect the value or desirability of the property, right? And so... We, when we tell clients when they're filling out the TDS, they got to disclose any material facts about the property that affect the value or desirability of the property, right? While a transfer disclosure statement discloses the information about the condition of the property, a ha natural hazard disclosure statement discloses the information on? D. 
correct, all the above. So typically we say the TDS covers the property itself, then the natural hazard disclosure statement covers anything that affects the property from without, from without, you know, beyond the boundaries of the property, right? That could come on. A final map for a subdivision could be to be created from the conversion of a residential real property into a condominium project shall not be approved unless each tenant of the proposed condominium has received a blank written notice of intent, intention to convert. B? B. Yeah, B. It is A, 180. You're like, what? So we have someone who wants to, well, we have someone that wants to, um, Kurt converting apartment complex to uh, to uh, condos. We know two things, right? We know that it, it, once they get the report to do it, they must allow the tenant to purchase it within 90 days. Okay. We also know that when they offer it to purchase, they have to offer it at the same price that they would offer it to the public or better. Now we know it says if the if the owner of apartment complex wants to convert it to an apartment uh, to a condo uh, to a condo complex, they must give notice to the tenant of 180 days prior to starting the process of conversion. Make sense? Sorry, that's going to be 180 day notice before you can start the conversion. Once you've got it and ready to offer it. 90 days, it must be offered to the tenants for a purchase, and it must be offered at a price that is equal to or better to what you're going to offer to the public. The disclosures upon transfer of residential property disclose, sorry, deals with the major disclosures required by California Civil Code. However, there are transfers that are exempt from these disclosure requirements. One of these exemptions is what? D. D. So remember I told you we have that transfer disclosure statement that is required by law that the seller has to give to the buyer, right? During the transaction that discloses any material facts affecting the value or desirability of property. But sometimes there's exemptions that the seller does not have to do that. Some of those exemptions are foreclosure sales. Why? because the bank for closing on the property doesn't know, hasn't lived in the property, they don't know the property, they only receive the property through the process of foreclosure because the, the owners didn't pay their bills, right? They didn't pay their mortgage. Court order transfers, and this is because the court doesn't know what the condition of the property is, right? They haven't lived in it. And if the transfer is from one owner to another, so if there's a transfer from one owner to another, the law assumes that the other owner, because they're also the owner of the house, knows the condition of the property ahead of time, right? Material changes in a subdivision itself or its terms of offering must be reported to the real estate commissioner. These material changes include the following except. Anyone? C. It is none. So if they do any physical change to subdivision, if there's any developments that they affect the utility of it. So if they um, decide to take out the clubhouse and, and not have a clubhouse, that would affect the development or utility of the subdivision. Or if they change any of the contract of the deed, they would have to get pre-approved with the Department of Justice. When a flood hazard is found to exist in the area, the flood hazard will describe the degree of frequency of such flood hazard. Flood hazard frequency refers to frequent, infrequent, and remote flooding, while the degree of hazard refers to the what? D. Is D. So they say there's, oh man, sorry. There is a uh, three areas on this frequency of 
frequent, infrequent, and remote. But then they're saying, how big is the issue? There is ponding, then street overflow, then possible flood and flood inundation, right? Flood and inundation, right? Make sense? Under the landlord tenant law, blank is basically a unilateral act on the tenant's part with a unilateral act. B. Okay. Correct. A abandonment. Remember, if the tenant just walks away from the property without telling the tenant, I mean, telling the landlord, that is considered abandonment and is considered a unilateral act because the tenant did it without agreement from the landlord. Right? An advanced fee in real estate is a prepaid fee that may be required by brokers to cover advertising expenses involving the marketing of a property or completing a transaction. The bank must approve the fee prior to collecting it from the client. C. C. Incorrect. You must get DRE approval before you can select collect an advanced fee. In fact, they have a process where you can submit it and you will get your answer usually within 48 hours if you do that. Um, why do realtors take advanced fees? To keep it out of the closing? No, they take advanced fees because sometimes, and this happens more on luxury properties, you may be spending as an agent a lot of money advertising the property. So I know you guys all watch like Millionaire Real Estate Agent and they have these extravagant open house parties with all the brokers in the area, right? And that party and all the things they do in photography and video and all that may require $20,000 to pull off, right? Well, you can go to your seller and say, hey, look, I'm gonna make a $100,000 commission on the sale, but I want up for 20 because that's what's gonna take the advertising. So on luxury, you tend to see advanced fees to cover that marketing portion of the budget. A preliminary so then would that be taken out of the commission at the end? Correct, correct. So like if an advanced fee would say, I'm going to make 3%, say I'm going to make, well, 3% of the commission of the sale of a home, but I'm going to prepay 20 of it. And then whatever I make on the sale of a home, 20 to 20,000 would be deducted from that. Okay, so. Gotcha. A preliminary public report can be issued by the Bureau of Real Estate if the subdivision project does not meet all the requirements yet. It will expire when? Oh, yeah. Sorry, one day. D. Correct. If you have a preliminary public report or a pink report, it will expire in one year if you don't have the final report. It will automatically expire when the final report is issued. Or if there's something that changes with the subdivision, you have to go back to the DRE to get a new report. Right? So what seller Quinn owns a residential property that needs rehabilitation, but he has neither the skill nor the money to complete the needed repairs. He decides to sell the property by marking down the price and selling the property as is in its dilapidated condition. Here, the contractual as is provision means what? B. B. It means D. So in California, even if you say as is, it doesn't absolve you of any liability. You still must disclose all the issues with the property, even if it's in dilapidated condition. If you say as is and say, take it or leave it, you can't do that. They still, you're still required to disclose. Now you're not required to do repairs to the property for the buyer, but you are required, you are required to disclose what are the defects with the property. So essentially saying as is provides no, uh, there's not less than liability of the buyer, I mean, of the seller in a transaction. 
Trust funds are money or other things of value which are received by the broker on behalf of the principal or any other person which will be held for the benefit of others in the performance of any act when the real estate license is required. Example of trust funds are the following, except That's a D. They're using a pink slip as a, a note for an automobile. So if you know, you can go get a, 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 a title loan on your car, right? That, we call that a pink slip. So, so um, trust funds can be anything of cash value, right? In fact, I had someone who owned a tow yard and they're buying a house. And he wanted to offer me anything. He had like cars, trucks, and boats in the yard. He said, can you take one of those instead of Paying a commission on the sale of their home. <laughs> An earnest money check that is deposited into escrow upon acceptance of the offer may be what? C. Correct. That is C. Good job. Broker audits and examinations regarding trust fund handling are ongoing pause and programs of the real estate commissioner. If an audit reveals actual trust fund imbalances, appropriate blank proceedings may be initiated. A. Correct A, disciplinary. Remember, theory is not the courts, so they can't actually arrest you or anything there, then, but they can discipline you and revoke your license. Buyer Sierra and seller Tom decide to go directly to, es to the escrow company and buyer Sierra makes out a check to escrow company and hands it directly to the escrow clerk Ursula. The broker in this transaction should? I'm gonna close my door for you. A? C. C, maintain records only the trust fund that passes in the hands of the benefit of the party. So you don't have to put any trust funds in your record of your trust fund account if it goes directly to escrow. I will say that most brokers do ask for a receipt of funds from escrow as proof that it was deposited, but not, but you wouldn't put it in trust fund in your trust fund record. The Natural Hazard Disclosure Act of California and California state law that requires sellers and their listing agents to provide prospective buyers with the natural hazard disclosure statement that informs where the properties they are selling is located in the hazard area. The report, which is paid for by the sellers, is prepared by all of the following except. Who doesn't prepare NHDs? Correct, because these are natural hazards. You're going to have geologists, land surveyors, engineers working on them. Not a lender, obviously. And EIR is a study of all the effects which a land development or construction project would have on the area's environment. EIR stands for what? C. C. Correct, an environmental impact report. Seller Ross sold his house to buyer Selva. Said house had a flaw which was intentionally hidden by Seller Ross to make the sale. This is an example of what? B. C. No, it is B, fraudulent misrepresentation. So when the seller lies about material defects of the property to the buyer, it's known as fraudulent misrepresentation. A blank, a blank is a document designed to give third party critical information on the relationship between the landlord and the tenant. The tenant is required to state that its disclosures in said document may be relied upon by the third party. Ooh, this is a tough one. Anyone know this? Anyone know what we're even talking about? Yeah. 
<laughs> it is a estoppel certificate. So estoppel is the concept in law that says um, the, the seller just can't say anything they want as a lie and provide it to the buyer because it affects in the transaction because it affects their value and desirability of the property. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but some information that the buyer can, that the seller can provide to the buyer can be third party verified. Mm -hmm. And because it's third party verified, now it's considered a valid disclosure or an accurate disclosure, uh, truthful disclosure to this buyer in this case. So, and in this case, we're talking about landlord and tenant. So for example, if I were a buyer, I'm an investor and I'm buying a property, uh, I'm buying an apartment complex, right? And the seller says, we rent all the apartments at $1,000 a month. Now, but what if he's lying and they're actually rented at $900 a month? He's just trying to get more money out of it, so I make a higher offer on the price. So we have this concept of estoppel. What happens is it says, landlord, you write down all the terms that you have for each of your land tenants. So he would literally go unit one through 16, say there's 16 units. Um, he would write what is the rent in terms for that unit. And then they would take it to the tenant themselves. And it says, Tenant, the seller is selling the property, the owner of the property is selling your, 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 your unit. And the seller is telling the buyer that your rent and terms of your lease rent are this. And the seller can say, yes, those are my terms or no, that's not, in, that's incorrect. If the tenant says yes, then we have estoppel. That means now that the seller has third party verification from the tenant of what the terms of lease are so that the buyer can rely on that information. That form we use to do that is called the estoppel certificate. Questions? Who would normally go, who would normally go verify with the tenant? Who would normally verify it with it? So typically yeah. the landlord would be required to verify it with the tenant. So. The landlord would typically fill out the terms that the lease is. They would go, and often it's, it's done by the property manager sometimes, or sometimes even by the listing agent. Um, they would go to the tenants themselves, and the tenants would have to sign to say, yes, this is accurate, right? So the tenant is putting their stamp of approval on it. So here's the thing. It, it's also a verification for the tenant as well and for the buyer. So if the tenant say that rent was, that the landlord said it was, um, a thousand on the estoppel certificate, and it was, and and then the tenant signs off on it. But then when the new buyer takes over, the new owner takes over. He says, "No, no, no! I have a lease for nine hundred. He could say, "No, on the estoppel certificate, you said it was a thousand. We're holding you to a thousand because you verified that information, right?" But typically, the listing probably most of the time, the listing agent is providing this to the seller or the property manager for them to fill out, get signed by the tenants and return to the listing agent so that they can disclose it to the buyer's name. Clear as mud? Right. Blank is misappropriating and actually using this, a principal's money. So now I'm not just co-mingling it, I'm using it. I get the rent and you know what? I'm behind on my mortgage. I'm gonna just take this person's rent and it's not my rent, it's for my tenant, for my client, but I'm just gonna take it and pay my rent. But don't worry, I have this commission closing in a few days and then I'll replace it with my commission so that when I give it to the land, the owner of the property, he won't know here. What do we call that? A. No, we call that B, we call that conversion. Because what you're doing is converting trust funds into personal funds, which is illegal, right? Testing for radon is the only way to know your home's radon levels. The following are radon testing devices, except
food. Yeah. D. D. So, charcoal canisters, which are the most cheap and most common, alpha debt track, alpha track detectors, and charcoal liquid scintillating devices, and electric ion chamber detectors are all ways you can um, test for radon. Although you'll most likely only find charcoal canisters because it tends to be the cheapest. So people tend to buy that, but you can order the other ones if you want. California's fair housing laws are as follows, except what? Which one is not our D. Correct. We have three major housing laws in California. The first one is the Unruh Civil Rights Act. Then we had the Fair Employment and Housing Act, also known as the Rumford Act. And then we had the Housing Financial Discrimination Act, called the Holden Act. So, so the Under the Civil Rights Act was the first one that says you can't discriminate for certain classes like race, gender, those sort of things, right? In housing. Then the Fair Employment and Housing Act did it for employment and housing. It says also it added, said you can't discriminate in employment hiring, but also it added some classes to that restriction. Most importantly, it added some classes such as familial status, um, sexual orientation, handicap, things like that. And then housing financial discrimination or the Holden Act added discriminate that you can't discriminate in lending and home lending. According to Civil Code Section 712 and 713, homeowners may place a for sale sign on the property displaying relevant information so long as. C. Correct, Joe. Long as it's not too big and not blocking traffic. Broker West wants to open a real estate office under a fictitious business name, You Are Realty. He can operate under the fictitious business name DBA when he has what? What does he have to do? D. Correct D. He must first go to the county clerk or county recorder's office, depending on who's doing it, and get a DBA issued, a fictitious business name approved. And then he has to get approval, mail that to the DRE, get approval from the DRE to use that name. At that point, Broker West can start using the real estate name. Constructive eviction is a breach of a covenant of warranty or quiet enjoyment. Examples of such would be any of the following except. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Sorry. Anyone? I don't know. So constructive eviction is when the tenant, I mean, the landlord on a property is refusing to do repairs to the property that affect the health and safety or client enjoyment of the property itself. Does this make sense? We call that constructive eviction, right? Where the tenant is forced to re endure unreasonable situations on the property. At that point, the tenant does have the right to um, fix those issues themselves and deduct that from the rent without the landlord's approval, right? Broker Ursula is managing an apartment complex where she collects rents and deposits them in her trust fund bank account. Also being a broker in other transactions, broker Ursula puts fire deposits in the same account. Broker Ursula's practice is what? A. A. It is B, it is legally permitted so long as she keeps separate records for each beneficiary transaction. Remember, a trust fund account is a trust fund account. Trust fund account just means it's not your money. And it's not your money in connection and you have this money in connection with your license, right? It doesn't matter if you're doing property management or real estate sales at the same time, 
you could deposit in the same trust account as long as you keep track of it, record it. The California Bureau of Real Estate is prohibited from issuing a, or, or renewing a full-term license if the applicant is on the list of obligors who have not complied with a court order to provide child support payments. Cal BRE will issue a blank license to an otherwise qualified applicant who is on the list of child support obligors. Anyone? I get this quite a lot. A. Correct, A, 150 day license. So if you owe money on your child support and you're not paying, they're gonna issue 150 day license, say get it back current. And um, this is the issue. I get letters all the time. This agent is not paying their account and they'll suspend your license. They'll give you like they used to get it fixed. I don't know what they'll suspend your license. And I have a sort of unrelated. What's that? What's the difference between the BRE and the DR? Um, the slide, the DRE was recently changed. Last year, they changed back to the Department of Real Estate. They were the Department of Real Estate. They, then it became the Bureau of Real Estate, and they were moved under the Department of Consumer Affairs. And then the California Association of Realtors lobbied to have it put back under its own department. And so it recently came back under the Department of Real Estate um, again um, as its own department. Um, so now it is, but at the time for a long, for about eight to 10 years, it was Cal BRE. Previously it was DRE, then it went Cal BRE, and now it's back to DRE, so. But these are a little old, so. If an audit is conducted by a real estate commissioner and it finds commingling or conversion of trust funds in excess of $10,000, the commissioner may enter an order to what? C? Correct, C. So if they audit your trust fund and they find you commingled or took Ten, more than $10,000 illegally, they can shut down your whole business right there and say, you are doing no more business until this is legal. The main objective of the Alquist Priolo Earthquake Fault Zoning Act is to prevent the construction of buildings used for human occupancy on the service trace of active faults. Before a new project is permitted, cities of Cal require a blank investigation show that the proposed building will not be constructed on active fault. B. Correct the geologic investigation. So that, there's law that says now you cannot build a building on an actual earthquake fault. Over an earthquake fault. But this act was built in, it was in the 80s. So there's some buildings on earthquake fault. You know what the most famous building in California is on an earthquake fault? San Andreas. San Andreas. Close. So in in um, there's a San Andreas Fault in the Bay Area. There's a branch of it called the Hayward Fault because it kind of goes from Hayward up through Berkeley. And actually at the University of California, Berkeley, the Memorial Stadium, their football stadium, is built right down the middle of it, goes the Hayward Fault. And um, California issued a requirement to them that said uh, they need to fix this problem. So they spent a bunch of money and the stadium is still there on the fault. But essentially if there were an earthquake and the fault were to part and expand, um, literally it goes down the length. So the football is still around, literally goes down the middle of the football field, right through the middle. It is built as two separate buildings now and it'll actually part and come apart. <laughs> <laughs> along with the crack in the, in the ground. So. Interesting. If the property lies within six hazardous areas as described in the natural hazard disclosure, the seller or the seller's agent must make appropriate disclosures on the... C? C. Good job, C, on both the NHD and the TDS. The following straight statements are true regarding unexplained trust account overages. Except, what does that mean? 
That means we're reconciling, we put money in and out and we're reconciling the account, but somehow we have more money in the trust account than we think we're supposed to have. And we can't figure out why. What do we do? D. Correct D. So what's that mean? It means if you have an overage on your account because you can't figure out why because you were a deadbeat and didn't really track things for a few years and now you're like, I don't know, I'm supposed to have $30,000 in there, but there's $30,000 and $5 there. I don't know why. I can't figure it out. If you can't determine that, then you must leave it in that account forever <laughs> until you can figure it out. Trust fund, trust fund handling violations are backed up by various penalties and consequences that apply when a broker misuses trust funds. These penalties include the following, except anyone? E. Correct. E. So if you mishandle trust funds, not only could you get disciplined by the Department of Real Estate, the person that you embezzled the money from could sue you and the district attorney can sue you for embezzlement as well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a triple whammy bad situation, so don't do it. The federal law that guarantees equal access to public accommodations for disabled persons is the what? Hey. Correct, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Well, this is a good one. The East and B. Strasburg case expanded the broker's duty to inspect and disclose. It ruled that the real estate brokers acting for a seller of a residential property has the affirmative duty to what? C. C. So Easton versus Strasburger, a very important case in California. Okay. It involved a house in Southern California, out in the hills in Southern California. Very expensive house. I think it was, I think it was a uh, 170,000, but this was back in the day, right? So it was a lot of money back then. <laughs> Not so much now. But the house is on a hillside. And what they had done is they brought in fill dirt because the house has to build on a flat land and there was slopes. So they brought in dirt so that they could, where the land is so that they could build the house that was flat. So they brought in fill dirt. Well, what they didn't know was, well, this area is tend to flash flooding and some strong rain. And the owner of the home, after they built it, put in this fill land, it actually, the, the fill, the, a uh, part of the fill land gave way and sort of wrecked the house's foundation, right? The owner obviously was wealthy. They built the home themselves. So they, what they, they do, they repaired it, repaired the foundation, repaired the home and put the fill land back. And what he did was he covered to prevent more erosion and things from happening. He covered all the fill dirt around the, that part of the uh, around that part of the house with a netting. You sometimes see that on the freeways when you're driving by, and there's hillsides and there's netting on it. It's to prevent erosion and other things from falling off that property. You know, so they put this netting over the property. Now, the seller goes to sell the property. All right? Seller knows, like, hey, you know, there was a landslide and part of the house fell off. You know. That's not a good thing to tell people when you're, you know, obviously you're trying to sell a house, right? So guess what the seller does? Any guess? He lies. Doesn't just Yeah, he doesn't disclose it. He's, he doesn't tell the listing agent. He doesn't tell the buyer's agent. Doesn't tell anybody that there was a landslide and there was house damage and foundation damage and I repaired it. And there's potential for more landslides in the future. He sells the house to the buyer. And guess what happens? 
another there's lesson. another rain and it erodes again and there's a landslide and the house foundation is damaged and the house is severely damaged because of this again. And he sues, and this guy was named Easton, and Strasburger was a seller. But he sues not only Strasburger, the seller, for lying to him, he also sues the listing agent and he sues the buyer's agent companies, both of them. And he says, Not only should the seller have told me, but the listing agent and my own buyer's agent should have seen the netting and, and the fill dirt. And because they're experts in real estate, they should have known that that is a, that is a sign that there's potential erosion or landslide issues on this property and they should have disclosed it to me. And you know what the California Supreme Court said? California Supreme Court said, yes, Easton, you are correct. The brokers, because they have a license, because they're specialized in real estate, they should have noticed the netting. It was a it was a significant defect with the property that as real estate agents in that area, they should have known about that and they should have disclosed it to the to the buyer, even if they weren't disclosed to it by the seller themselves. So this threw us in a this through real estate is in a big tizzy, and it says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, agents themselves, irrespective of what the sellers say, are also responsible for disclosing what they call significant defects with a property. Even if the seller doesn't tell you about it, you can be held liable for it. So when this decision happened, it was a big deal in California for agents because now we have what we call an agent visual inspection disclosure. Agents are required to visually inspect a property and report all um, significant defects with the property that they visually see. Okay. Now, remember, I told you the number one of the lawsuits happens when buyer sellers buyers sue sellers for non-disclosure. But the number one way agents get sued is buyers suing agents for not disclosing significant defects of a property on their agent visual inspection disclosure that they should have disclosed. Does that make sense? Clear as mud? Yep. All right, let me tell you a little story about this. We had an agent, brand new agent, first transaction, right? She had this buyer, first time buyer, he's a young kid, trying to buy a house. He can't afford much, so he buys this house, but they find this house in the in Sacramento. It's kind of in a poor area, but that's okay. It's a flip home, brand new. They're flipping it, small home, not big. I forget what he buys it. This is back toward the recession, so it's like 195000 right? Buys a home, it's a flip. But um, they try to do an inspection on the home. Uh, there's a tenant in the house. He won't let the inspector in on the home, so they cancel. So the owner of the home, the listing agent on the home, the selling home, who happens to be also the owner of the home, the owner home, which is a bad situation. The owner of the home is the listing agent, and he's the one who rehabbed the property. Okay, all my sense. The listing agent says, and who's the owner of home says, "Hey, I know you can't get access, but how about this? I can send my home inspector down there right now, my personal home inspector down there now, and he will do the home inspection for you if you're okay with that." And she was a new agent. She didn't know what she was doing. She kind of said, yes, which is a bad idea. You should not let the seller's home inspector inspect the home. Why? Because obviously if it's the seller's home inspector, they're going to have bias toward the seller, right? Anyways, they inspect the home. They found out the home, some of the flooring was uneven in the home. It was not flat. It was a raised foundation, so it was uneven. So if you put a marble on there, it would roll one direction. Does that make sense? Which is not good for a home. So they actually asked for repairs. They say the living room floor is uneven. Can you repair it? And they've actually, the buyer, the seller agreed. They went and opened up the floor. They did some stuff and they evened it out. The buyer even saw the home when it was open, when they opened it up. Okay. Also part of the problem with the home when they did the home inspection was 
there was no access to the underneath the home. That means when they put the new flooring in the home, they covered up access so you can crawl underneath the house and look at the bottom of the house. You couldn't do it. But they kind of, the buyer's agent didn't know what they're doing. There was a for sale. They were desperate to make it happen. So they just kind of blew that issue off for the buyer. Anyways, they end up buying the home and he has a housewarming party and his retired dad comes to the home and his retired dad is a former contractor. And guess what he says? He says, son, your floor is uneven. You probably have a foundation issue. Did you have that inspected? And he goes, well, we got some repairs, but we couldn't get access to the bottom of the house. So they actually, the contractor cuts access to the house, bottom of the house goes beneath and see there's standing water there for some time and it's undermined the foundation of the home and the foundation of the home needs to be replaced. They call us very upset. We represented the buyer and I go down there and I literally walk into one of the bathrooms and it's so uneven, it has a shower in there and there's shower doors, right? You know, over shower doors, right? And they're on rollers and the shower door is all rolled to one side because it's so uneven. If I rolled it closed, it would roll back. <laughs> you couldn't even keep the shower doors closed, how uneven the house was, okay? Now they sued, they sued both the seller, the listing agent and us. Now they sued the seller for non-disclosure or hiding stuff but they also sued our broker, our agent, because they said she didn't disclose the uneven floors as a significant defect in her visual inspection, and she should have. And what happened is she did her visual inspection, but she was kind of an agent that was kind of want to make things go quick and, you know, let's do this quick. And she just didn't even put uneven floors in there. And she's like, but he knew, he knew because we did a request for repair on these. He saw the floor open. He saw them repair the, some of the uneven floors. He knew, and you know what? She still lost. And the reason was she didn't report it in her agent visual inspection disclosure because legal in California, if you want, you need to disclose all material defects with the property that you can visually see with the property and she should have disclosed it. Make sense? Yep. So it's a very big deal. There's a lot of liability around it. So it's very important that you get, that your broker train you well on how to fill out an agent visual inspection disclosure. So I digress. That was probably a need to know, but you probably need to know Strasburger, Easton versus Strasburger is a very big case. If the disclosures regarding transfer of residential property have, oh, of a residential property have not been delivered in a timely fashion, the buyer has the right to rescind the offer. The right is embodied in what, as stated in the California Civil Code section 1112.8? Okay. That is correct. One method of performing trust, of, trust account reconciliation is to locate any difference on the sets of accounting records. The differences can be caused by all the following except. The Correct. So when you do trust fund handling, they typically ask that you do triple reconciliation. The Department of Real Estate asks you to do that, which means you reconcile it with the bank account statement, but you also reconcile it with your tenant ledger. That means you track when the tenant's paid and not paid and what's owed. They ask you to check against both to make sure it lines up. A real estate broker's personal funds of up to blank may be in the trust account to cover bank charges. A. Correct. So you can have up to $200 in the trust fund account of your own money to cover bank charges and not be considered co -mingling. Reconciliation is a process of comparing two or more sets of records to verify whether their balances agree. The accuracy of records is verified by recon reconciling them blank a month. C. Once a month, 
because you only get your bank statements once a month. So you can always like sign them once a month. Property management fees can be what? D. Correct. It could be a percentage, flat fee, all those things. Oops. The Dodd Frank Act instituted, instituted and created a number of new laws and the rules that apply to the real estate industry. One of the changes created was a prohibition of finder's fees or kickbacks. The parties that are allowed to receive payment in the real estate transaction include the party that. D. C actively worked on the transaction to completion. So I had, uh, we had a, we didn't have an agent. There was an agent um, that we found out was going to all the people he knew. He says, if you refer me someone, a friend or family member who wants to buy or sell a home and they close, I will actually give you, I think he was giving $500 or something like that, I forget. That is considered a kickback and a violation of the Frank Act. And he was disciplined by the Department of Real Estate. I think his license was actually revoked. Title eight of the Civil Rights Act of 1960 is more commonly referred to as what? C. Correct, the Federal Fair Housing Act. So whenever they talk about titles, um, it's always federal. Federal Fair Housing Act. So in 1968, they passed the, if you may remember your American history, uh, John F. Kennedy recently was assassinated. Lyndon Johnson was now president, who was previous vice president, and he tried to pass the Civil Rights Act, which um, John F. Kennedy tried to pass but couldn't. And he got it passed. And as part of that encompassing Civil Rights Act um, was the Federal Fair Housing Act, prohibiting discrimination in housing. There are phases to environmental site assessments. When a site is considered contaminated, a phase blank ESA may be conducted. C? It is B or A, sorry, there are two. There's phase one and phase two. Phase one is just doing a site assessment to consider if it's contaminated. If they believe it is, they will issue phase two which is actually, then they will do actual chemical tests on the property. One of the following is not a type of subdivision. What is not a type of subdivision? So we know you can subdivide houses, but did you know a condominium is a subdivision? Are timeshares a subdivision? Land projects a subdivision? D. Correct. So it just doesn't have to be parcels. Remember condominiums, when you buy a condominium, you're buying air, you're buying airspace. <laughs> so timeshares, what are you buying? You're buying airspace for only a period of time. Does that make sense? <laughs> for a certain period of time. So all those things are still considered subdivisions. All the following are correct regarding the as is clause and the real estate tr transaction, except A. B. So it is D, the as is clause suggests that the seller is released from liability, or is it, but it's not true. It does not set, it does not set the free obligation of the property to provide disclosures. As opposed to buyer notes, the sale is made without warranty. That means the seller is not going to do repairs or warranty any repairs, right? The lead paste paint disclosure was enacted in what? Eighteen ninety-six. It was passed in nineteen ninety-six, but 
it um, it targeted homes built 1978 or earlier. So lead paste paint paint was banned in 1979, saying, um, but we didn't pass a law that required sellers to disclose if they have lead-based paint on the property until 1996. Do you know what the solution is if you have lead-based paint on your property? What the recommended solution is? No, what is it? It is to paint over it with paint that is non-lead-based. <laughs> so that is actually the proposed solution to lead-based paint on properties. So, but if the home was built prior to 1978, there is likely layers of paint that have lead in them. So if you're gonna strip the whole property down to the wood, um, you're probably gonna have to um, be very careful about lead contamination, so. The subdivided land law is designed to protect subdivision buyers from blank in subdivision sales. The Uh, it is seven o'clock. Would you like to keep going? We have some, we have a good amount of questions to go still, but I can go fast if you want. Want to keep going? Yeah. Yeah, keep going. All right. The Homer's Guide to Earthquake Safety is an informational booklet designed to help property owners spot and correct earthquake related concerns. The seller must deliver the Homer's Guide to the property if. D. Correct. All those. 1960 construction like thing, one to four units. The actual sampling blank, the sampling of blank is typically not conducted during phase one environmental site assessment. D. D. Correct. D. All of those above. The difference between fraud and misrepresentation is what? What's the difference between fraud and misrepresentation? D. D. So fraud and misrepresentation. If I intentionally lie to you to benefit me profit, then that is. Mis that is fraud. But if I say something that is wrong, that is still end up untruthful, uh, incorrect, that is a misrepresentation. Don't worry, both are illegal. So if you don't know and you say something out of guessing, you can get yourself in trouble. So we tell agents, if you don't know the answer, don't attempt to answer it. Go ask your broker, all right? The Conference Civil Code Section 101.2.6 requires that a blank of a property consisting of one to four dwelling units subject to the lien of a Melrose Community Facilities District make a good faith effort to obtain from the district a disclosure notice concerning the special tax and give the prospective notice to the buyer. So who is required to give the notice of potential Melrose on the home from the to the buyer? Hey. No, the seller is. Typically, this is conducted within the natural hazard disclosure statement, though. Usually, we don't cover that part. So. Seller Ramon is not sure if his property lies in a flood zone area. He should do what? Hey. Correct. He should hire a third party specialized in natural hazard disclosures or an NHD report. The seller and any broker of, or agent involved in a transaction must participate in the TDS disclosures. Where there are more than one broker or agent involved, the broker or agent who obtained the offer delivers the disclosure to the prospective. Hey. They deliver it to the buyer. A document or finding that is a, of a proposed project would have no effect on the environment is called a what? So they do an EIR, they conduct an environmental inspection 
on the property and there's a report and it says there's no environmental detriment to building this property. What do we call it? Correct, it's called a negative declaration or sometimes referred to as a neg deck. Neg deck. Reconciliation of trust fund accounts held by real estate brokers must be performed. Monthly. Monthly, correct. Anytime a material change occurs in a subdivision, an amended or new public report is required. A material change includes all the following except. D. Correct. A blind ad. What is a blind ad? D. Correct. So if you write an ad and there's only an address or PO box or only a phone number, no name, no nothing, no license number, it's called a blind ad. That is illegal. Illegal. Designed to give financial relief to those who have been victimized by licensees, fraudulent actions, and Cal DRE administers a victim's fund known as the what? C. Correct. The consumer recovery account. The local agency may deny approval of a subdivision if it finds the site is not physically suitable for the proposed subdivision project. One of the following can limit the feasibility of a subdivision. D. Correct, all of those like water problems, which are like flooding, right? <laughs> Mrs. Pearson builds a new apartment complex. As part of their marketing strategy, she decides to make units available only to single tenants Including her advertisers, the phrase singles only, Miss Parsons' advertisement is what? C. Correct. It is illegal because it's discriminating on marital status. Correct. The amount left over after all commissions have been paid out is known as what? This is my favorite A. word. What? A. Correct. I love this. When we issue a commission and we pay our agents out their portion of the commission, anything less left over is known as company dollar, which as broker I love because that's my income. Even if a real estate agent is employed by a broker as an independent contractor, the broker must carry blank insurance for the real estate agent. C. None. Well, actually. Actually, let me correct that. That is, um, they actually ruled that recently we must, you're considered also employees under real estate law in California. So we must carry workers' comp premiums. So we do carry workers' comp. All brokers will have errors and emissions insurance to cover in case a lawsuit is not required, but all brokers do. Mrs. Hernandez is a disabled woman who uses a wheelchair and needs to install a ramp on her newly built condominium. The HOA prohibited this thing. The changes to the exterior of Mrs. Hernandez's homes are restricted. The HOA's action, the HOA's action is? B. Correct, B, illegal. They cannot discriminate because she is disabled even if it is a restriction on the HOA. If the broker's license duty to be familiar with and to familiarize their salesperson with the requirements of federal and state laws and regulations regarding prohibition of discrimination in the sale, rental, or financing of real property, those laws and regulations include the following except. D. Correct, you must know all those laws. Sell us out, seller Alice listed her home with broker Bob. Broker Bob bought, brought in an offer that satisfies the terms of the listing contract. Buyer Carl, Carl, who was financially qualified, is of a different race than Seller Alice. Seller Alice rejected the offer based on Carl's race, a decision that Broker Bob adhered to. 
Who has violated the Fair Housing Act? Seller Alex? D. D. Correct, Seller Ellis and Broker Bob have both violated the Fair Housing Act because he went along with that decision. If he told Seller Ellis, I'm sorry, you can't do that. You're, can't, you're rejecting this offer based on race. That is illegal. And Seller Ellis said, I want you to do it anyways. At that point, Broker Bob needs to quit and says, I am refusing to be your listing agent any longer. I am hereby canceling due to um, illegal acts. Good luck. Make sense? A fiduciary relationship is a special relationship of trust and confidence. A fiduciary relationship exists between principal and an agent. As, as such an exact, exact relationship exists between what? Correct. So I want to take a little bit of seconds here and note that when you get your license, you your main thing you're having is that you're, you have a fiduciary duty to your clients. And that is hot, oops, that is highly specialized in California. It is similar to a doctor patient relationship or attorney client relationship. So what does that mean? That means when you say things on behalf, you're an agent of your seller or buyer. When you say or do certain things, those reflect on the seller. So if you lie to the buyer, may say you just don't even lie. You you do a misrepresentation. You say something about the property that isn't true, but you didn't know it, but you just said it. That buyer can sue, but they can sue you and they can sue the seller at the same time because of your fiduciary relationship. The seller's like, I never told that to my listing agent. I didn't sell her. It doesn't matter you had a fiduciary relationship. Now the seller could sue you for fraud, right? Does it make sense or misrepresentation? So just note that fiduciary relationship is important. That means what you say and do in the transaction reflects on your client financially and legally. Make sense? So. And you must look out for the financial best interests of, of the person. And often I have agents come to me and um, they have an issue, they're like, ah, oh, you know, this or that, this or that, this or that. And, you know, um, if we do this, it's going to reduce the price or, um, you know, um, and it's going to reduce my commission. And I have to tell her what's in the best interest of the seller. It doesn't matter what's in the best interest of the agent, what's in the best interest of the seller. One of the fine statements is true regarding the retaking of the real estate exam. So what if you don't pass your exam, but if you're in this training, don't worry, you're gonna pass your exam. But what if you don't pass your exam, what, what, what's correct? D. Correct. You can, you can take as many, man, why do this? You can take as many exams as long as possible within a two-year period. Otherwise, you have to reply after that. The best, the highest one I've seen is 14 times. So, but don't do 14 times. That is ridiculous. A licensed real estate broker should keep copies of documents in connection with transactions for which a real estate broker is licensed for how many years? A. C. Uh, C, three years, you're required to retain documents. Although RESPA, which is a federal law, requires five years. So as brokers, we just tell everyone to keep everything five years. The DRE says three. A subdivider is required to provide a copy of their public report to who? C. Right. C. Correct. So if you go to a new home to builder, you can ask for the public report and they require to keep it. One of the following terms is the desk fee in a brokerage office. What's a desk fee? You pay to use all the services that the offers offers. Right. So how do we calculate a desk fee? B. 
B. B, sorry. Correct, B. You take the total expenses and you divide it. That is how it used to be done. It is not done that way any longer. So there's it's, it's a much more complicated system and there's a lot of brokerages that do it a lot of different ways. So when you um, interview a brokerage, I recommend you get um, clarity around how they do their uh, commission splits and fees. So. Real estate salesperson Jake resigned from Broker Kate and is now employed by Broker Lloyd. Broker Lloyd should give notification of this fact to the real estate commissioner within blank days. How many days? B. Correct. Five days. Good job, John. All the four may be puffing statements, except what's a puffing statement? All of those are considered puffing when you exaggerate uh, the good points of a product or business. So if you say, this home is the best deal in this neighborhood, and unless you have proof of that, you're puffing. Puffing is illegal. Well, I'm sorry. Such statements are permissible as long as they're not fraudulent. So you can say this is the best house deal in the neighborhood by square foot price, which you probably, and if you can verify that, then it's not puffing. So. Our, but if you say this, like for example, this house is such a deal, you'll never find this deal again, you need to buy this house now, that would probably be an example of puffing, which is illegal, because it's fraudulent. Article 10 of the Code of Ethics prohibits realtors to blank against persons because of race, color, religion, sex, handicap, or permissive ask national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity. I think we know this, right? Discriminate. The Code of Ethical Standards of the Practice of National Association states under the Standard of Practice 16.4 that realtors shall not solicit a listing was currently listed exclusively for another broker. However, if the listing broker, when asked by the realtor, refused to disclose the expiration date and nature of such soliciting, the, list, the realtor may what? D. Correct. D. The advanced fee agreement verified accounting format and all other materials used in advertising, promoting, soliciting, and negotiating the advanced fee agreement must be submitted to the Calvary not less than blank calendar days before publication or other use. B. Is D attendee. So if you want to advertise or do an advance fee, you must give Calgary 10 days notice. The Bureau of Real Estate Consumer Recovery Count is intended to bring financial relief to the following except. Who does it not give relief to? C. Or B. <laughs> Correct. B, if you lost in court and you, the agent was not found guilty, then you're not going to get money from the consumer. One of the following is true regarding a broker's composition and negotiability of commissions. Anyone? D. Correct. All commissions are negotiable. All commissions are negotiable. 
Miss Farrell, a real estate salesperson, is helping Mr. and Mrs. Greg, an African American couple, find two find a two hundred thousand dollar home to purchase. Miss Farrell showed homes to Greg's to the Greg's, and a price area in areas where ethnic families are predominant. While there are homes in the two hundred thousand price range in white neighborhoods, Miss Farrell did not show them to the Greg's because she strongly believes the Greg's would not fit in or not be comfortable in a white neighborhood. Miss Farrell is guilty of the legal practice of what? A, steering. If you are purposely steering your clients to different neighborhoods based on racial profiling of that neighbor, of that couple or the neighborhood, then you are steering, which is illegal. After the Civil War, Congress passed laws. One of these laws prohibits all types of racial discrimination in real estate to, impl to implement the blank amendment. Ooh, what amendment? What amendment did we pass after the Civil War? Hey. Yes, we passed the 13th Amendment that freed the slaves and said, you shall not discriminate. And then they passed the law. Do you know that was passed in 1865? Then the next Civil Rights Act, that means the act that said freed the slaves and said they're citizens, the next act that actually dealt with civil rights was not until 1968, which we talked about, which was the Federal Fair Housing Act. So it was over 103 years later, after the freeing, after the Civil Rights Act, that we actually passed a Civil Rights Act that says you can't discriminate against them in a bunch of areas, including housing, which is amazing. Any discriminatory language that exists in an association CC and hour should be taken out. The association boards are obligated to delete discriminatory restrictions and can do so. B. B, without approval from the homeowners. Does everyone know what CCNRs are? Conditions, covenants, and restrictions? So if you have buy a house with an HOA, but sometimes you don't even have the HOA, they'll put CCNRs on a property uh, subdivision, and they'll say, um, these are rules that say you can't paint your house purple, um, you know, you gotta maintain your yard, you know, all those sort of things. If there's a homeowner station HOA, the HOA will get power from the CCNRs. So the CCNR says, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, and then the HOA has authority to enforce those provisions on all the homeowners in this community. That is CCR. Back in the old days, to prevent to prevent um, and discriminate against certain races, um, they would put language in the CCNRs that said you couldn't. These type of people couldn't buy homes, couldn't live in this neighborhood. In fact, um, are you guys all from Sacramento area? From Marysville area. On Sacramento area, there's an area called um, uh, Oak Park, which is a primarily uh, disadvantaged community, as minority, a lot a heavy minority population, actually. But did you know when it was built, actually, back in the 1920s? There is language in the CCNRs that state no African Americans will live in this pro live in this neighborhood, which is quite ironic, but it's now stricken. You actually will get a cot if you buy a house in there, you'll get a copy of it. You know, see it written on there and stroking out. <laughs> Pretty funny, actually. Salesperson Jake's employment was terminated by Broker Kate. Broker Kate should give the salesperson Jake his license to him back to him within blank business days following his termination. A. Correct, three days. So he has three days to give it back to the licensee, and 10 days to report it to the new licensee, to the new broker. When there is a decision by the commissioner to pay from the consumer recovery account, the payment results in the following. Okay. So the worst part about this, say you commit fraud as a real estate agent, you get sued by the person you frauded you get sued by the district attorney for fraud. 
and say that you lose and you owe them money now, you don't have any money. So they go to the consumer recovery account, the commissioner gives them money, you get your license automatically suspended and you owe the consumer recovery the money at a 10% interest rate and you just lost your license. <laughs> so you have no job, right? So you are really screwed. So don't fraud, it's really stupid. And I don't know why you would do that. I, I can tell you we had an agent in our office. I wasn't broker yet, it was in my union. And he committed fraud and he lost his license. He was about 10 years in the business. He was doing about a hundred transactions a year. He was um, making uh, several hundred thousand dollars a year and um, he lost it all because he was stupid. One of the essential elements of an advanced fee agreement is agreement must obligate the broker to deposit the advance fee into what? B. Correct, a trust account. One of the following statements is not true regarding public reports. What is not true regarding public reports? C. C. Correct. The pilot report for the, must be kept up for five years. Right? It's not. The final pilot report is valid for five years, um, but receipt of the report signed by the owners must be kept on file for three years. So, so when you buy a new subdivision, buy a subdivision, buy a new home in a subdivision, you're going to get a copy of the public report. The public report is valid for five years, but the receipt. The buyer signs a receipt for the public court that the builder only has to keep that on file for three years. 20 year old Melissa successfully completed three college level courses to qualify the real estate sales for exam. Upon passing exam, she has one year to apply for the license. One of the following is not required to apply for a real estate license. You guys should know this. You D. Yeah, you guys did. <laughs> An agent must disclose to the principal all known relevant and material information pertaining to the scope of agency. The agents must disclose all the following except. D. D. Yes. Agents must disclose any facts of value desired by the property concerning the transaction. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act prohibits a discrimination in lending. It is federal law that forbids. Ooh, what does it forbid? C. C. Correct. It presents redlining. Why do they call it redlining? What's redlining? Drawing a big red line on a map. On a map, yeah. The banks used to go like, here's our city. We don't want to lend in the poor areas because it's risky. And they would draw a red line around the, those neighborhoods to say, if they live in those neighborhoods, they don't get a loan. That is called redlining and that is illegal. Mr. Edward is a new real estate agent. After struggling to gain listings, he realized success through reminding people that ethnic groups that moved into their neighborhood a statement is, you know, that signifies that your property values in a few years. This is an example of what? D. 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 It should be D. Actually. Yes, panic peddling, panic selling, and blockbusting. That should be D. That's wrong. But um, actually, I knew about some of them. I had a good friend in the neighborhood down in Vacaville and um, his dad, he was kind of racist, I, I knew the dad. And um, he ended up selling his house because an agent went to his house and said, hey, a bunch of African-Americans are moving to your neighborhood, you need to move. And he panicked them and he sold. Very sad. The legal practice of panic selling is also referred to as? 
see. Correct, block busting, hold on, block busting as well. Title eight of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 is also known as what? B. Correct, the Fair Housing Act, very good. Broker Day persuades the Andersons, a white family, to list their home for sale after informing them minority families have moved to the area. Broker's Day action is known as? B or A? No, it's not. This is block sell, block listing, no, it's block busting. Sorry, I, I read that wrong. Yeah, no problem. Anderson. Ms. Ibarra stated a new day, started a new daycare home in her townhouse unit. The HOA sent her letter preventing her to run a daycare at her home. The HOA's action is? Or was, or is, or can, can not. See. Okay. It's enforceable. So, yes. Normally, you can run it no, if there is a new daycare, you're allowed to run it. But if you're in an HOA, the HOA is allowed to restrict um, uh, daycare use of residential property. In fact, they can restrict all, any business based on property. All the following statements are true regarding a salesperson's affiliation with a broker once a salesperson has passed the salesperson exam and is about to be licensed, except. Now, B. It is D. So you can get issued a salesperson license if you pass a test without even being affiliated with a broker. You can apply for it. You can even receive your license without being affiliated with a broker. You'll be deemed, deemed you'll be designated as MBA, no broker affiliation. But once licensed, you will not be able to engage in any real estate activities without being affiliated with a broker. You must hang your license with a broker to do real estate activities. This one just says you will be able to do activities even with, with your license without being affiliated with a broker. That is incorrect. Your salesperson license does not allow you to unilaterally do real estate, ex, real estate um, activities. You must do them under the supervision of a broker as a salesperson. An unlicensed sales assistant in a real estate office may not do the following except. C. None of the above. So an unlicensed person can't uh, solicit buyers, solicit sellers, or quote or discuss price terms. The question wording. What's that? The wording of the questions is always okay. Yeah, that's cool. The Rumford Act consists of the following provisions, prohibitions, except. D. 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 Correct. So. Landlord Neil and tenant Olive entered into a two year lease on a retail space. Six months of the lease, tenant Olive realized she, was, she, not, she would not be able to continue paying the rent and asked Landlord Neil to release her from the lease. Landlord Neil agrees. In Landlord Tenant Law, this is known as. C. Correct. C. Surrender. A complaint uh, with the Department of Fair Housing and an employment of fair housing must be filed within blank days from the date violation allegedly occurred. A? C? It is A, 60 days. So from the time that the violation occurs, if it's a fair housing violation, they must report it within 60 days. Congratulations, everyone. We have finished the section on practice of real estate disclosures. Uh, 
Any questions? Uh, we have one more and then we'll start back at the top. We'll go over contracts next week. So um, anyone have their test date imminent? So. No, not yet. I have two, like, oh, uh, like those 100 question tests to do, and then I'll be ready. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get those. Yeah. So that's so much to do. Testing? They processed my fee, so hopefully soon I'll hear, but no. Oh, yeah. No, they processed your fee. Like, you should have it pretty soon. Yeah. I, I just checked the my... website, and they showed that um, they were processing, like, early April. This is like a week ago though. So yeah, they're in the main now, I think so. Yeah. So. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah, I just scheduled mine for um end of July. Nice, nice. All right. Perfect. Well, um, I appreciate you guys' time. Thank you for sharing your evening with me. I know your time is precious and I appreciate you sharing with me. Um, let your friends know who are getting their license. We'd love to help them as well. And once again I'm John Bernardo with uh, Keller Williams Rookie, Sac Metro and I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you everyone. Have a great Thank evening. You. Hope this was helpful. Thank you. Thanks, John. All right. Thank you. Good night, everybody.